Now I would like to welcome and introduce our panelists who have graciously rejoined us tonight to answer all of your questions about your burning environmental decisions, choices that you make every day. Um, first, we have Emily G. Emily is a change maker and social impact leader. She is currently the marketing communications manager at Arrow Farms, which is recognized as one of Fast Company's most innovative companies and Time's best inventions of 2019. Arrow Farms is transforming agriculture and their Dream Greens brand of baby and microgreens is a sustainably focused indoor vertical farming company. Emily, together with Ali Bus-Jager, served as co-executive directors of Grades of Green, a nonprofit dedicated to inspiring kids to care for the earth, scaling this NGO to over half a million students globally. Emily currently chairs the advisory committee for Grades of Green. And we just um, had have Marcus Erickson joined us. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for being here. He is rejoining us again tonight. Marcus is the Director of Science and Innovation for Five Gyres Institute. He and Anna Cummins began the Five Gyres Institute with an 88-day journey from California to Hawaii on junk, a homemade raft built from 15,000 plastic bottles. Marcus has led expeditions around the world to research plastic marine pollution, publishing the first global estimate of plastic pollution floating in the world's oceans. As steadfast advocate for our waters, Marcus co-discovered plastic microbeads in the Great Lakes, which led to the Federal Microbead, Fee, Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015. His expeditions today rally young leaders in industry, science, activism, and the arts with the intention to provide science and understanding to a new generation, like Emily, who went on one of these expeditions. Marcus has authored many research studies and two books, Junk Raft, An Ocean Voyage, and A Rising Tide of Activism to Fight Plastic Pollution, and My River Home. Then we also have with us one of our teen uh, superstars, Riley Goldfarb. She is a student at Redondo Union High School, where she has been actively involved with Grades of Green for nine years. She is a natural leader who has organized school green teams. She's implemented lunch waste sorting stations. She's hosted environmental festivals and has actively helped with the passage of Manhattan Beach City Council's ban on plastic straws by canvassing local restaurants for support. Riley hopes to translate her passion for environmental preservation into a career and hopefully a lifetime mission. We are also delighted to have with us Lisa Ryder. Lisa is an award-winning environmentalist with 20 years of experience. In her professional work with waste management and her volunteer work, she inspires businesses, schools, and the public to participate in sustainability initiatives promoting conservation. Lisa has greened over 100 companies and has developed and launched green business certification programs across Southern California. Lisa is also a master gardener and a backyard composter, and she has shared her expertise with thousands of would-be environmentalists. Then we have Tristan miller mancy Tristan is a programming co-lead for Citizens Climate Lobbies California Conference and vice chair of Climate Realities OC and trained by Al Gore. Yay, I'm hoping to be trained by Al Gore at the end of May. Tristan has presented to schools, colleges, conferences, and businesses, including Sony Pictures and PlayStation. She brings 25 years of international PR and marketing experience to her work. She has managed over 100 successful campaigns for major firms and has produced events, videos, documentaries, events like Earth Day on the Mall in Washington, DC, One World for PBS, CBS Sports, a series of PSAs called People for the Planet. Wow lots. So welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really, really appreciate you coming back to answer questions. Um, so we're going to try to make this a very kind of casual, informal back and forth. Um, I would like to invite the panelists, please, to um, feel free to answer any of the questions, to offer any additional insights, um, if we begin discussing an issue and you feel you have something significant you'd like to share, this is not uh, to be a fully structured 
um, evening, but really more of a dialogue to the extent we can make it that. So um, to kick us off, I would like for each of you to share with us, if you would, um, an answer to this question. If you had a magic wand and people would change just one or two behaviors to help the environment, what would you ask them to do? So um, let's see, Emily, would you like to go first to answer that? Sure, um, to have everyone kind of experience their, their why of why by um, the environment or what the environment um, means to them. So whether that's going outside, if it's surfing, if it's hiking, if it's protecting for the next generation, I'm just finding that that why. And I think there's so many different whys and everyone's reasons for, um, you know, for sustainability and um, taking action are um, are different and that's so great. So for me, I would say um, finding that, that why and um, then go, being able to go back to um, every action that we make kind of goes back to that. And then I would say on a um, on a one habit change level, um, I would say one that just finding one um, to be kind of consistent uh, consistent with and then continue to, to add on from there. So right now, the um, action that I'm uh, currently working on is um, making sure that I uh, that I'm uh, that I'm not like refusing straws or you know not not taking something when I um, either take to go food or picking up food. So that's my one that I'm working on right now. That's a great one. I try to do that every time I get home with a takeout order and I see plastic utensils, I just want to scream. I'm like, why didn't I say, thank you. I don't want those. Please don't put them in, right? I, I mean, because usually they're in before you even see the package. So um, that's a great one. And I also love the idea of thinking about what motivates your desire to take those green actions. There was a wonderful um, op-ed piece by Timothy Egan in the New York Times earlier this week, where he, he commented on how, because of the pandemic, so many people are spending so much more time in the out of doors and enjoying all the wonderful things that nature offers us. And he saw that as an extremely hopeful thing that people are falling in love with the planet again and with the outdoors and that that alone will be motivating, hopefully change at all levels of society. So thank you for that, Emily. Um, let's see, Riley, would you like to um, share with us what would you change if you could? Yeah, sure. Um, first, I would say, I wish on a more global level that people could see and acknowledge the importance of the environment and the need to take action. Too many people, sadly, don't believe there's a such thing as climate change, despite all the evidence and the natural disasters and calamities that have been taking place all around the world. If those people could stop denying the obvious truth and instead accept that we have affected the environment it would give them a sense of motivation and empowerment to create solutions and help right the wrongs. The second thing I would say um, would be that it's not, well, I would say it's not necessarily a behavior that needs to change, but rather our view on plastic pollution and recycling that needs to change. The need that recycling, the idea that recycling is the answer is too simplistic and wrong. It's wish cycling, where you're wishing the problem away. Plastic producers have spent a lot of money and time trying to convince consumers that we have to do that what we that all we have to do is just be more mindful and recycle more. No matter how effective at recycling we become, it won't matter because new plastic is cheaper and when companies are given huge and these companies are given huge government subs subsidies, which is not okay. We need to take action through political and consumer advocacy to force these plastic producers to take responsibility for the plastic pollution mess they've created and put pressure to, to find sustainable products. So while I'd love to say that reducing the amount of single use plastics you consume or doing a better job at recycling would save our environment, I think that what we need to focus on is changing how we view the problem and the real cause of it in order to have effective solutions. 
right on. Fantastic. Yeah. Well done, Riley. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly with both of those things. And I especially wish people who in their hearts know that climate change is real, but who yet insist on denying it and enacting policies that pretend it doesn't exist, really need to look themselves in the mirror, right? And say, is this, a, you know, how can you sleep at night? So anyways, thank you, Riley. Okay, um, Tristan, how about you? What would you change if there were one or two behaviors you could change? Well, thank you guys so much for having me here. It's such a really, it's like family getting together with all of you. And um, I love seeing action like this that's at all of our level, like it hits us home. And I think in my journey of getting involved in you know climate action, if you knew me a few years ago, I didn't even know half of what I knew now. And what I have found has been effective is getting involved at the local level politically. I mean, just before I came to this meeting, I was meeting with our city council member and we are right now drafting a climate emergency resolution. And I had our neighbors come, I had students from high schools, I had spoken at an eco club, I invited them to come. I invited our Floral Park Neighborhood Association. We're all like pulling together from all parts of life and we need to be starting to engage in our government level. Find out who, who are your elected officials at your city council. It's easy to find, go to your city website. All their emails or addresses are there. Start emailing them, letting them know what you care about. You don't want to, to have plastics in their environment. Um, you don't want to have um, you know, emissions increasing in your community. You want a program like Community Choice Energy, like so many cities have, which I don't have in my city. So there's lots of ways that you can advocate. Have them write a climate emergency resolution. Have them looking at ways to green their community. Um, and it's, it's, it's work, but you can, an email a week makes a huge difference. They need to hear from you when they start seeing you know, 10 emails on a topic and then start talking about it. The other issue is, is that 72% of us know this is going on and yet only a third of us talk about it. We have to move outside of talking to the choir and get that new friend, get that new neighbor. And that was my, I'm, not, I'm, I'm doing that now because I wasn't doing it enough. Um, and so now I, everywhere I go, I'm even if somebody's walking the dog or whatever, um, I say, hey, let me get your number. Let's get on Zoom. Let's talk about it. And so we're building those coalitions. The other thing I love is trees. Think about it. Planting a tree, you know, takes the emissions that are equal to one car driving on the road. So I really think trees provide shelter. They provide habitat. I know that it's not the only solution, but I think it's something that we can all rally around. So looking for ways that your community can come together and get trees planted. Whenever I have a webinar, I work with One Tree Planted and we plant a tree for everybody that attends. So we've got 16 attendees and I'm going to plant a tree for all of you guys for coming today. I love- so you've already done an eco action right there. Just by coming, you're getting a tree planted. Tristan, thank you. That's fantastic. I love that. Plant a tree, send an email and use your voice. Talk to people. Love it. Those are simple, easy. We can do that. We can do that. All right, Lisa, what about you? What are one or two things that you would change? Um, well, thank you for having me. And uh, questions from the previous gals are excellent and I couldn't agree with more. Um, and um, my things, um, my two main things, actually I have three, but the two main ones is, um, and I, uh, you know, I teach composting. So one of the things I tell people is that um, if, if, if everybody would compost and stop eating meat, um, those are the two most important things we individually can do. Um, is to be, is it, so, and so my wish is for the world to become composting vegetarians. Um, and I think that would, that would save a huge amount of carbon. And that's something we can do individually um, on our own and make and take that action and have a very impactful action. And then the third one would be is um, our travel. Um, I'm hoping, you know, we can get our grid upgraded so that we can, you know, start decarbonizing our travel more. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so the flying less, 
um, driving electric or as little as possible. And when we have to fly or do anything, we can we buy offset credits. So really trying to decarbonize our travel because those are the really the three main categories and the things that we have the most control over um, individually. Yeah, I love carbon offsets too. I'm with you there. And and the thing about you know becoming a vegetarian, it also is water conservation. And land conservation and protecting, you know, our beautiful forests. So it just impacts everything on top of having a huge impact on emissions and climate. Right. Yeah. And okay. even if you can't go completely meat free, you can reduce your meat intake significantly each week. Say I'm going to cut out one meat meal that I would normally have. You know, baby steps lead lead to big change. So okay. And lastly, Marcus. Will you share with us, please, what are your thoughts about one or two things that uh, individuals could do in your wish list that would help our planet? You know, um, uh, I've dedicated my life to, to ocean plastics, to now looking at plastic pollution on a global scale. Um, so the one thing that I would say that kind of applies to, to many things in life is, uh, is a simple phrase, trade, trade ego for we go. So trading, trading the sense of, of what can I do for myself, what can we do for others and with others. We have seen so much, so much advancement in, the, in policy and innovation in a whole plastic pollution space that I work in when people work together. I can tell you in the last couple of days, there has been tremendous uh, moves forward in the plastic pollution world. So I'll share with you just in the last 48 hours um, yesterday, the Break Free from Plastic Federal Act was, uh, was submitted. Uh, that's a federal bill that's going to, it's, it's going to bring back bottle bills, it's going to eliminate some use plastics, protect frontline workers, frontline communities. It's a powerful bill. Then today, the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network had an assembly of over 150 uh, brands and nonprofits all organized uh, to talk about the, the United Nations Global Treaty on Plastic Pollution, which UNEA is gonna vote on in about a year, a year and a half from now. And then yesterday I had a, an op-ed published in the Washington Post about a paper I published on, on plastics in camels. And, the, and the, the thesis of that op-ed was that we can't call plastic pollution an ocean issue anymore. It really is global. And at the end, calling on the Biden administration to support the, uh, the UN Global Treaty. What I have witnessed in the last you know, couple of decades in this issue is tremendous gains through collaboration. When we passed the microbead bill back in 2015, that was a federal bill that was over 50 organizations sharing media, uh, putting together uh, what a federal bill might look like. Um, so trading ego for we go together get organized as an individual. Now what you can do for yourself, how you can you organize in your community to take action on, on any subject? That's the, the one big thing I would suggest. Fantastic, yes, thank you. Um, and you know, right now um, in Hermosa Beach where I live, we have a council seat open and you know, looking at candidates for office and what their green track record is and what their green policy is, is an important way to take action in your community too. So thank you, Marcus. And now our first giveaway for the evening is a signed copy of Marcus's second book, Junk Raft, An Ocean Voyage and a Rising Tide of Activism to Fight Plastic Pollution. This book tells the story of Marcus and his team as they were fighting to solve the problem of plastic pollution. The voyage he took from Los Angeles to Hawaii aboard this homemade raft built from 15,000 plastic bottles. Um, the book recounts his successful efforts to fight corporate influence and demand that plastic producers take responsibility for the problem they have created along the lines of what Riley was saying. So, um, okay, Laura, who is our first winner who gets a signed copy of the book? Well, I'm excited to tell you that our winner is Heather Murphy Garcia. Heather, congratulations. Yay. Congratulations, Heather. Well done. I know you will enjoy that book. Um, 
Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to move into the questions that were submitted in advance of this webinar by some of our um, attendees. And um, I think I want to start maybe with um, some recycling questions. Um, there is so much plastic that enters our household in so many different forms. And I think I'm going to address this one to you, Lisa, um, since you have spent so much time with waste management focusing on this recycling um, problem that we all face. So the questions range from, well, I'll tell you, the first one is, what do we do with thick bubble wrap? Is there any way to recycle that? No. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> Use newspaper, right? When I was a kid, everything came packaged in newspaper. And in fact, in many countries that I have visited over my lifetime, when I made a purchase and they said, I'll pack it for you, everything was wrapped in newspaper. So um, wouldn't that be nice? Somebody tell that to Amazon, please. If Marcus, is that in the bill that break free from plastics to start to demand that companies like Amazon um, stop using these kinds of products. And also for, you know, some of us have to pick up our groceries. We can, some people cannot go into the stores. So love to see that start being part of the picture in the bill. Yes, so yes, EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, is a big part of the bill. So yeah, you, you have, uh, that's one policy mechanism to try to deal with that excess packaging, all that Amazon stuff you get in FedEx, UPS. But in the private sector, we're seeing innovation as well. There's one company called Repack. Uh, it's R-E-P-A-K, and they have a reusable mailer. Can we be reused you know, a couple hundred times before it begins to, to fall apart through wear and tear? But the, what the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is going to uh, to create, as well as a UN treaty, um, is, is, a, is a space for innovation in the reuse economy. And that's what we're seeing, hyper-local. So the things you throw away can be replaced by the, the reuse local economy. And we're seeing the innovation fill that space very quickly. Right. Yes. And we're, you know, here in Manhattan Beach, we have our Stephanie Cochran with the Wasteless Shop, where you can bring your containers to get your, and, and buy in bulk in your own container, your laundry detergent and your dishwashing soap and you know all of that so that you're not at Target in the aisles bringing home another giant plastic container into your house. So I think that's really so important that local initiative is, as you said. Back to the activism point of it, um, you know, we get things with the bubble wrap, we get um, styrofoam, any products that you get delivered um, with that kind of material, I always write back to the manufacturers and tell them, I'm not going to buy your product again if you're going to put it in, um, you know, if you're not going to use an alternative. So using your voice, um, your choice, you know, you have the power as a consumer to, to drive change. So make sure that, you know, when you see that happen that, you know, Amazon, it's top Amazon, such a behemoth, but I think it's legislation like Marcus is talking about will hopefully um, drive that change. Yeah. Another company that I think is doing a really innovative job is Loop, um, where you can also send that a send back in and, and um, in that reuse economy as well. So Loop by TerraCycle, I think, is doing some, some really great stuff in that space, too. Yeah. yeah, I think I read that Kroger has started a, um, a program with Loop to see if, if they can make that workable, which is fantastic, right, to have a major grocery store like that, um, willing to give it a try, even. Um, okay, another problem, plastic, plastic, the film plastic, you know, the um, saran wrap that's on top of the veggies that you buy at Trader Joe's, and that is your newspaper comes in that plastic bag, and, you know, th this is, we know this film plastic is not recyclable. What do we do about it? What can we do with it? What can we do to stop it? Mm. Uh, that's a really good question. I still, you know, get a newspaper and, and I do use the bags for my, um, my dog, but um, you know, you're right. You still get the little wrapping on top of the cucumbers or whatever, or, or else it comes in like a little uh, plastic 
clamshell of some sort. So, um, you know, farmers markets, you can bring your own little bags to, um, and, you know, a lot of the grocery stores, you know, it's stuff is not in plastic. Unfortunately, that's my thing about Trader Joe's, all their stuff is uh, pre-wrapped, unfortunately, but a lot of it is less. So, you know, again, activism, mentioning it to the stores, um, you know, I know the other question there was also about bulk and that when you buy nuts and things like that, everything comes in plastic now and all the bulk um, uh, bins are gone and who knows when they're going to come back. Same thing with like taking your, your reusable um, mug to the coffee shop. And um, that's so that little bit of a pet peeve of mine that we can't <laughs> do the co use the coffee mugs. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, it's, you know, the, at least the number ones are recycled and a lot of the, the stuff does come in number one plastic containers. Um, you know, again, you know, I, you guys were talking about the recycling and, you know, all that. So, uh, you know, I hate to always say, oh, we can recycle it, but the, the ones are at least the one, one of the two plastics we actually, um, that are some are mostly being recycled. Like you said, this type of film plastic is not recyclable since it's too flimsy. And to me, I believe that um, this plastic needs, doesn't necessarily need to be used for these products or used at all. Um, more of the plastic products are being developed that can't be recycled, which is really upsetting. I recommend actually advocating for banning the use of these plastics as it has no benefits, but rather pollutes the environment and it's in some poor animal's stomach who mistook it for food. Instead, we should look for more alternatives to these products, though there aren't great candidates though. Um, but I think the best and most effective solution, using your voice to complain to corporations and companies that are producing these products to talk to local representatives and demand a change is the best way to deal with this issue. Thank you, Riley. I agree. There has to be a better way. There ha I mean, there, there just has to be. So we will, we will use our voices and, and figure it out. Um, so let's move on to consumer goods because there were a couple of questions, one related to toilet paper, another related to laundry detergent. And basically, how do you make the greenest choice when you are looking at purchasing something? Do you look at where the content is sourced, whether it's ecologically produced or says it's ecologically produced. Um, does it travel halfway across the world? Is it organic? But what if it's organic, but in plastic, whereas something that is full of chemicals is in cardboard? So how do we, the same thing with toilet paper, do you use the one that doesn't come from old growth trees, but it's wrapped in plastic, whereas there's another one that is made, you know, a hundred miles from you and is in, you know, whatever is wrapped in paper. I mean, so how do you, how do you make those choices? How do you weigh those factors to choose among the array of products that are on the shelf? I'm happy to address that because with the green business program, we, um, we've done a lot of research on bamboo toilet paper versus, um, uh, forest, um, certified um, steward, stewardship certified uh, paper um, uh, versus uh, recycled content. And the, the opinion is after the research is that the recycled content is by far and away the best option um, and making sure that it's post consumer. Um, all that toilet paper you buy at, um, at you know, Kirkland and from, from uh, Costco or um, yeah, Costco and um, you know, the Scott paper or whatever, none of that has virgin, con has, I mean, excuse me, it's all virgin content. There's absolutely no recycled content, in any of those. It will say if it's recycled, recycled toilet paper. Um, the best ones I've found are, and the most affordable actually is Trader Joe's has recycled. They also sell non-recycled now too. So just make sure you get the one that's recycled. Um, and, you know, seventh generation and, you know, a lot of the stores have a few, there's a few different brands out there now but make sure it's 100% um, recycled content post-consumer. Um, and because even the bamboo forests are now being decimated. So, um, and we are, I think we're cutting that down like 750,000 trees a year for our toilet paper. So when you hear that, you just go, wait a minute. So 
buying recycled toilet paper is is a really important thing to do for sure and then also um looking for if it can be in in bulk packaging so that there's less of the outside film or that or if it's in um you know uh, paper or cardboard on the outside and then if something is local um so kind of looking at those and remembering that uh, there's also other ways to be able to look at the company and look what the company is, is standing for and what the impact of that company is as well. Um, one, uh, a few companies that, that come to mind um, that I, uh, you know, kind of look for uh, and it will be, or certifications is like the B Corp certification um, to see what the, the impact and the standards are. Um, and all of the B Corp companies have all of their standards very transparent on the B Corp website. So if you're looking for a way to kind of look at companies across the board, looking for a certification and being able to see that transparency um, has been helpful for me as a Yeah, and more and more they're starting to have apps like I use Bicot. Um, and so I can scan things or just look up products that, you know, especially like if you're looking for more natural products and makeup and things, it's it's a good tool. It's not perfect, but the more we use it, it, it helps. It's a good little tool. I love that I, um, that apps like that too. Yeah, the more that we all put our information in, the better and more accurate it is too. So kind of fun to just also see from a citizen um, kind of perspective as well and, and that collective action. Right, yeah, I love it. It's like ways for environmentalists, right? So <laughs> yeah. and I, I think at some point we need to move to a discussion about economy, like circular economy, because too much why the plastics epidemic happened was really because there was the price of disposing of plastic was not factored into the price of the product. Mm -hmm. And so now cities and communities, we're bearing the price of trying getting rid of these and then piling up and so on and so forth. So this $1 bottle of water actually does not cost $1. It's costing animals their lives. It's costing our oceans, you know, it's costing our land. So, you know, we need to start getting to a more circular, fair, just economy that factors in those costs. So, you know, that's a bigger discussion, but it's really important. Right. Well, it's hugely important. And, you know, in legal jargon, we call those opportunity costs. And the business world totally knows how to price for that. They do it all the time in their business transactions, but they are just choosing to ignore it because no one's holding their feet to the fire. But as Marcus said earlier, there now are some, you know, international and federal initiatives that will require our businesses and corporations to take responsibility for what they are producing. And, and I do feel that they have been hugely successful in laying the guilt trip on the consumers, where the consumers are made to feel guilty about purchasing things that are not, that are packaged or that are not produced in a sustainable way. And we're told you have to, we have to be the ones to make the green choice. And while, yes, that's what this whole series has been about, how we can make green choices, that we shouldn't be bearing the burden of corporate actions, that they need to be responsible for their waste and to provide us with greener alternatives so that we're not trying to, to figure it out as consumers. And as you said, that the local municipalities are not trying to figure out what to do with the waste and we're not shipping it halfway across the planet where they have no capacity to recycle or do anything with our waste. It's just shifting the problem somewhere else. It's just mm -hmm. shifting. And I think if Americans, you know, before all this happened, when you could travel and you'd go to other countries, I mean, I, would, I grew up in Thailand for several years and you just could not believe the, issue, the trash problem that was going on. Yeah. Um, so it's, we can't shift the problem anymore. And it's also a vote for why you need more climate education you know, earlier on. But let's go to the giveaway. Right, and here's, here's a giveaway that will help educate you um, about the climate. So um, this is a copy of Bill Gates' book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Bill Gates has spent a decade investigating the causes and effects of climate change. In this urgent and authoritative book, Bill Gates sets out a wide ranging practical and accessible plan for how the world can get to zero greenhouse gas emissions 
in time to avoid a climate catastrophe. So, okay, um, who is our winner, Laura, of Bill Gates' book? Our winner is Vanessa Poster. Congratulations, Vanessa. Congratulations, Vanessa. That's awesome. Um, we do have questions about um, takeout packaging. What's the best choice for that? Um, we also have a question about um, fossil fuels and what is the, you know, is it realistic for us to get to zero dependence on fossil fuels? Um, that's more of an esoteric kind of question, but I think it's one worth talking about. Um, Let's jump into the, the takeout one because that's been a big thing this last year, I think. Okay. What's the best choice of containers? Is it the old fashioned, you know, you would get your Chinese food with a little cardboard thing with a wire handle on it. If all of our takeout came in those, would we be doing a big service to our planet? That's a really tough question. And we, and we um, grappled this with this with the Green Business Program. Um, I because it is such a difficult one, because most people don't compost their, um, the quote, compostable ones, which a lot of them say they are. Um, but if you, unless you um, have a municipal composting program that accepts it, um, or backyard compost, which a lot of them are not backyard compostable. So there's the whole composting issue. Um, and I tend to like the ones that are the, I know it's probably not <laughs> the most environmentally, sound one but those little the black plastic with the clear lids because you can reuse those and I and I do I reuse them um we don't do it very often uh, take out but um so as far as it, it is really a big dilemma so finding ones that have recycled content but that's what we tell our restaurants when we advise restaurants on what what's probably the greener options um and if they have a composting program one that is that can be composted you know, how many people are going to compost it? Uh, the reality is most people end up just throwing it away. So, um, you know, and paper products, you know, there's less carbon than the plastic. So it, it is, it is, I wish I had like a really clear cut answer, but, um, you know, doing less takeout and like you said, you know, not getting the utensils and the napkins and, um, and someday hopefully we can get back to bringing our own stuff for takeouts. But, um, yeah, the fewer, the fewer items, the better for sure. There's a couple of programs. I'm just hopeful that they will take off. Um, like Jai, they're starting to get the, the restaurants involved that will, you know, take that extra step. And I was reading an article about in New York, they're actually starting this whole circular, um, you know, takeout where the containers are, you know, definitely reasonable. They're like stainless steel or there's something like that. And, you know, if, if that just could take off and people would, you know, latch onto that, it, um, that sounds like a wonderful advancement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a company called GoBox. Mm -hmm. It's a reusable to go container. And when multiple restaurants, you know, agree to accept that, that box, then uh, what happens, restaurants will wash it, give the consumer, and they can bring it to another restaurant to return uh -huh. it. And reuse it. That's probably the reuse economy. There's a company called Vessel has a reusable stainless steel cup and mug that mm -hmm. restaurants and coffee shops. So, so we're seeing these local economies, like I mentioned earlier. You know, Go Box is one great example for for to go uh, to go food. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So that's so hopeful when companies realize people are asking for it. They're just waiting and for that option. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was in Charlottesville last fall with my daughter and we um, got to go from a local restaurant and they, um, they didn't, we, we were staying in a hotel room so we didn't have any utensils and they didn't have any plastic utensils. And they <laughs> said, well, here, we're just gonna give you some of our stainless steel knives and forks and would you drop it back off at the restaurant tomorrow? And I was like, I'm so happy to do that. I'm thrilled to do that, right? You know, I mean, how hard was it for me to do that? It was so easy. So I'm, I, I would love for that idea to take off. I really would. Um, okay, so we did have one about, um, about airborne plastics and the microplastics in the air. And that one is for Marcus really what is the, the idea that we're breathing in plastic is horrifying to me. Um, 
what is the biggest source of these airborne plastics? Well, the airborne, some of it's just urban dust. You know, dust actually crosses oceans. Historically, you have found, you know, sediment hitting the upper atmosphere and crossing vast oceans. So now plastic is joining that. So urban dust is one. Um, one point source, and we're going to study this, uh, we have a colleague now five years that just, five years just joined us, Lisa Ertl, uh, a young researcher, and she's really interested in microfibers. And we're looking at laundromats as a point source. Uh, we did some preliminary studies. I went to one laundromat and I was actually sampling uh, the surfaces of, of, of leaves, of buildings, of rooftops. And I found that in a perimeter near uh, laundromats, tremendous amounts of microfibers on those, those flat surfaces up high. So we're gonna study this and see, are, is that one point source? Another of course is, is effluent from, from waste treatment facilities where you know, cities are, 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 are treating waste, fibers slip through and the emissions of those is tremendous. But that's, that's aquatic, that's not necessarily airborne. But airborne, one big point source um, is laundromats uh, and urban dust, just dust getting kicked up in our urban settings that travel for miles. And we have found those, those fibers actually in, in, in icebergs, on the tops of mountains, um, every beach, every soil sample, we find microfibers everywhere. You know, that kind of makes me think about, you know, we've been wearing masks for the last year, um, which for COVID purposes, but has that impacted, you know, our breathing of these airborne microplastics? I mean, has that, is that a, a benefit of masks, not to say we want to keep wearing them at all, but are they too small? Do the masks they... themselves? Yeah. Oh, are the masks themselves releasing fibers into us or are they no. stopping fibers? Are, are they stopping us from breathing in? I would think so. Yeah, I, I, I would think that they do. Yes. But you know, there's been evidence of, of, of microfibers in, in human lungs since the 70s. Now it's, it's accelerating because of the, the emissions from all these, all these sources. But I think masks, sure. I would think they could stop some of, some of the large fibers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. So could very, very fine filters on these businesses, you know, <laughs> <laughs> exhaust systems, if they, you know, I mean, technology and innovation could do it. And if they could do it and make it available, cheaply enough and if our regulators could require it you know so there's there's always ways to deal with it even if we can't completely rid ourselves of the problem we can hopefully filter it out marcus i saw on the five gyres website that you are starting a new study on pha which is interesting to me because that is a possible solution right if it really does break down we what we expect can you tell us a little bit about that study uh, sure. We did a study three years ago. We took a PLA, that's your common little green cup you'll get at, at eco events made from PLA. It's compostable, but that's a very tricky word because many people think compostable means it's going to disappear in the oceans, in the environment, on land, in the sea, in your backyard compost, and it does not. Um, in our study, we had a bunch of PLA products. I put them under a fishing dock for two years. And in my backyard, buried that deep for two years. And the PLA, nothing happened. The PLA straws, the cups, the bag was still there. But I had one PHA product. And in two years, in the ocean, this thick beach toy made the PHA was gone. So now we're starting next month. We have 20 products, um, a, a PHA, a pen, a bag, a straw, a cup lid, um, some samples of film. We're going to put those in six environments. Uh, aquatic and terrestrial environments in Maine and Florida and California and put them in these environments for 64 weeks. And we'll take one set out at two weeks, one set out at four weeks, eight, 16, 32, and 64. And that should give us a good understanding how PHA performs. I, my hypothesis is in the aquatic environment, it will disappear very quickly, especially the film. Um, in the terrestrial environments, not, not, not sure. So how is PHA gonna benefit society? Um, we don't want that to replace all the single-use throwaway items. We don't wanna replace one single-use throwaway with another single-use throwaway. But it is a great transition material. And many companies are, 
are not going to give up plastics because, for example, it does keep your it does keep salads green longer. Um, it it aids in in transporting goods across uh, across long distances. So plastic has its place, but PHA depends on the blend can have the properties of conventional plastics, but if it gets lost, have the degradation metrics that are similar to paper. So it's a promising material. There's a need for R&D. We're going to do this eco study. And in a year and a half, we'll have some results to share. What's it mostly made of, the PHA? Of uh, polyhydroxyl alkanoate. There's PHA and PHB. Uh, PHB actually uh, is, is being made by an, an amazing company, New Light Technologies, uh, here in Huntington Beach. Uh, they just began making PHB straws. Um, PHB is is the truly natural. Um, uh, it's a natural polymer. It shouldn't be classified plastics, but it behaves like plastic when you extract it from microbes. So they take methane, and from that they they let microbes eat the methane. And microbes will then store energy in the form of PHA or, or PHB. If you can extract that, it acts like plastic. If it gets lost, microbes take it back. So that's it, it's really an amazing material. Um, so once we do our study, I think we'll have a better idea of, of what applications it really should be applied to. Oh, that's, that's great. I did want to mention about PLA. Um, because uh, like you said, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it does act just like plastic and which is why this, the local cities um, in the utensil ban, um, the straw and the um, fork knife utensil ban is, uh, in, is in, PLA is in that ban because it acts just like plastics. Um, so um, from what, I've under, what I understand, the PLAs also have, a lot of them have um, um, petroleum products in it as well, so even though they say they're plant-based, they all often mix in a little bit of, uh, there's usually often some kind of a uh, petroleum product. So anyway, so those P PLA, stay away. Oh, are PLA being recycled or no? No, and, and the thing is our, our you know, we're tooled for, for petroleum-based plastic recycling. So we don't have any way right now to recycle the PLA. And because it is sort of a niche product, I don't see that really happening. I mean, the whole point of PLA was that it was gonna be compostable but the composters don't even want it because it takes so long to break down and they have a, they have a window that they want this stuff to be composted within and it, and it just doesn't break down. Um, and like I said, a lot of them have um, some amount of, uh, even if it's a trace amount of petroleum products and they, the composters don't want that as well. So let's, let's move now to our wrap up question because we always like to end on an upbeat note. Um, we've, are going to ask each of our panelists if they would share with us one thing in today's world that gives them optimism for the future of our planet and um, for our environment. So um, let's go ahead and start. We'll, we'll go reverse order this time. Uh, Marcus, why don't you tell us what you're optimistic about? Seeing people, young people like Riley here on this panel and the activism coming from the, the, the newest generation are really taking it on. For them, uh, from what I see, my perspective is that change is the norm and that, and that the young people today just say, look, we want a different world, we want a better world and we're gonna make it happen. So that gives me tremendous optimism. Here, here, I love that. Lisa, what about you? What gives you optimism? Um, I definitely agree with Marcus on that one, and uh, I love seeing these young people, um, but I'd also have to say innovation. I think there's a lot of exciting things coming with um, carbon removal, sequestration, and you know we have to remember that even though we're all trying to get to net zero carbon, we still have legacy carbon in the environment, like massive quantities, and we have to get rid of that too. So we need to find ways that we can uh, remove the existing carbon in the environment. So all the innovation out there, um, you know, follow it. We need to um, encourage it, invest in it, and, uh, and, and you know, try to be hopeful. Hey, Tristan, what about you? Wow. <clears throat> I think that, you know, it's that ripple effect that is going on where each of us do our part and just keep letting the ripple effect go out into kind of the planet. Um, and that, you know, the future generation for me is they're not making 
climate a bipartisan issue. They're not making what's going on right now divisive. They're using it as a way to unify them because they get it. This is the one world we have. We've got to live within the means of our one world. And they find it as an issue to collaborate on and save money and, you know, clean the environment and create jobs and, you know, build renewable solar grids and have resiliency and create opportunities for innovation and education. So I just think we need this generation here and now. And um, I think we'd be in a far different place if that they were. But um, they're coming up and this is what's the most exciting thing. This is why I do this. This is why I give up time to do other things is because you know the time is now. I think this is a pivotal year for all of us to, to do what we can. Um, and I think to do that, just weekly try to think of one little thing and engage your family, sit down with your kids and talk about what's the new green thing they wanna do or what they wanna learn about. Um, and schools are crying out for this. Um, I, I try to reach out to my kids' own teachers and find ways that I can, you know, present or speak or um, you know, talk to the students about this. So um, I definitely think, you know, trying to do that one thing and let it ripple is so important. Riley, what gives you cause for optimism? <laughs> Um, one area in particular I've recently become aware of and definitely excited about is the different legislative measures being pushed that benefit the environment. I'm very optimistic learning about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that was just recently introduced, like Marcus was saying, and I believe it will have like a great positive effect towards our environment as it deals with the overall issues of plastic pollution by not only focusing on how it is a human health issue that disproportionately affects poor minority communities, but also wants to deal with the main issue at hand, which is defeating the powerful corporations and political figures that profit from the use of these plastics. While it is a slow change, the Break Free from Plastic Act gives me a lot of hope, and I believe that we will be moving in the right direction with this. Thank you, Riley. And uh, last but not least, Emily, what gives you cause for optimism? Oh, yeah. Um, I, loved, I love hearing all of this and so many things to be excite, excited about and, and um, have optimism about. For me, I think it's the collaborations that we've seen with public and private coming together and foundation support and more investment in the area um, and really uh, being able to come together together with, with academia as well to make sure that, um, you know, there's solutions that embody all of these different um, stakeholders and making sure that they're solutions that create impact and can kind of advance with a collaborative effort going forward as well. Yes, great. Yeah. Like Marcus said, stop thinking about the ego and think about all of us working together and the impact that we have on each other and what we can get done if we work with each other. So with that in mind, um, there are a few things coming up that um, maybe we wanna share with our um, attendees tonight. Um, I know South Bay Cares has a few initiatives. Really quickly let you know, April is Earth Month. We're excited to launch into um, you know, a concentrated or a way to really um, honor our earth and and take um, more action than we might be doing. And so South Bay Cares is going to, we're trying to team up with businesses, um, really trying to help drive traffic to businesses, to restaurants, to places that of course, as you know, have really been impacted. Um, and as those businesses participate, they will have a, a sign or you know type of flyer. We'll be publicizing what businesses are participating. And we wanna do beach cleanups uh, or any cleanups really, beach uh, walking path cleanups, cleanups with your safe group. And as you take a picture of yourselves cleaning up, you can go to the restaurants that participate or not just restaurants, businesses, show them your, your picture. And, you know, whatever it is that they can contribute, whether it's a, you know, a discount off of something, or again, we're not asking for them to go 
any way other than you know what they might maybe they'll give you a high five or something but really the idea is to get our community energized together to you know two things that we love which are our businesses and our 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 environment our beaches and our our areas that we like to walk we have such wonderful in south bay walking areas so you know there are more masks around there are more things and if you just um can have your reusable bag and gloves by your door by your dog leash and like making this the habit the time to say it's so easy i'm just going to grab that at the same time i'm going to um, go out with you know my dog or my friends and safely um pick up what is along the way it's so easy take a picture and you then if something is coming up that is again the same type of trash then the next step is we let our city council know there are a heck of a lot of this around uh, masks or whatever else and then there it would be you know the step to to do that so that's what south bay cares is going to be doing in april thank you dolly um i would like to thank all of our panelists this evening for being with us for being with us twice um and the first <laughs> series that the speaker series that they participated in and then coming back tonight to answer your, your questions and um, to share with us again their passion and knowledge and expertise in how we can be become um, environmentalists in our everyday life. So this is the last of our sustainability series, but we are already starting to discuss our next speaker series which will focus on environmental justice we are planning to partner the south bay cares racial justice group and create a series of webinars that will address how vulnerable populations are impacted um, by environmental issues along with other social and racial justice issues so, um, and of course, focusing on how we can make a positive change. So stay tuned for more information about that. Um, if any of our participants this evening would like to get involved with South Bay Cares or to help with future webinars or any other activities that South Bay Cares undertakes, please contact Dolly Gamble, our fearless leader. She is at sbcenvironment at gmail.com. And with no further ado, I will, we will do our final giveaway. We are once again delighted to um, give away an item donated by Lori Allen of Elmarie Sea Treasures. Um, Lori started walking our local beaches when she was rehabbing her ankle after an auto accident and in the process became a passionate advocate for our oceans. She collects both treasure and trash on her walks and she turns the treasure sea glass into art. She's an avid photographer and is giving away this eight by 10 canvas. Winner is Laura. Okay, I think the stars are aligning. I'm gonna just take a second because when we started this series way back in September, there was one person who spoke up and said that it would be really great to end it with this wrap up webinar, um, you know, because they had all these questions and <laughs> Dee Dee Moore, I hope that we have answered your questions because I could not even believe it. I use a random number generator and when the number correlated to your name, I thought I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket because um, <laughs> Dee Dee inspired tonight. Thank you, Dee Dee. Dee Dee has been passionate asking questions and really trying to find all the right answers for the environment. We appreciate that. And I'm so excited that you are the winner of Lori's Canvas. <laughs> Yay, congratulations, Dee Dee. So I do want to thank all of you for attending. Those of you who are new to us this evening, those of you who have been with us throughout the series, it's been a real pleasure. I've loved to get to know all of our fa fantastic, fabulous speakers who have shared their time with us over the course of this series, and in particular, the speakers who are with us tonight. So thank you all so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing everyone when we start up our environmental justice series later this year. And happy Earth Month. Yeah, happy Earth Month. Yes, happy Earth Month.
Thank you, everyone.